we played the 50-50 tour. As you know, 50 states in 50 days, and our, our Massachusetts play was in Boston, and it was an area down in uh, Boston they called the Combat Zone. I, I think the Boston Police Department called it that because it was so rough. Anyway, I was really um, impressed by our fans who live in the Boston area, and they know what they're getting into going down to that, that area. And still we packed them in. It was like, uh, and you know, some people would say, well, that's that's the key to having a good following. I said, no, that's a key to rock and roll itself. You know, people will bear the elements to go here to show. So we tried to make the show as long and as energetic as possible. So we wore the combat zone down. <laughs> the first time we met George Thurber was sometime in the middle 70s, a few years ago. We'd heard about him for months because we had a customer that kept coming over to the warehouse. He bought records from us every Friday, John Forward. And he kept telling us to check out this guy, George Thurgood. Two songs into the evening, I called Ken on the phone and said, you got to get over here too. You can see this guy. It was, uh, he was like shot from guns. He was all energy. The whole band just exuded uh, energy and, and fun. I scarcely remember the first time, and I'm not even sure what the first time was that I saw George. Um, but I do know that the first time um, I met him was probably as important as the first time I heard him because I felt really overwhelmed by um, his belief in what he was doing, um, his desire to entertain people, and his feeling that not only did he love what he was doing, but that it was something that spoke to people and that wasn't around very much. Originally when we saw George, we felt that he was too rocky and that we were a roots label. I think we talked to George and he actually stayed at our place for a number of times before we finally convinced ourselves that he was blues but with higher energy and um, some rock influences. I grew up listening to Chuck Berry and Little Richard and, uh, and some country music too uh, in the late 1950s. George and the Destroyers were playing that kind of music and they were kind of giving it a new life. Well, every record company we contacted said no. Rounder said maybe. They were trying to be nice. Well, maybe's better than no. <laughs> Okay, and I was making some demos and really having a miserable time. So they stepped in, so they said, we'll do a record with you. I said, oh, that's terrific. Well, we've been doing what we've been doing for a really short time at that point. So I think it's fair to say that by the time we met George Thorogood and the Destroyers, we all were growing up together. We had done a number of records that basically spoke to more the folk and bluegrass um, and sort of country blues community. Not so much anything to do with commercial radio. Putting out George's first record kind of changed all that. The first record took off slowly. We didn't know what was going to happen. We had no idea what the reaction was going to be, and it, it built very slowly, and that was good for us because we were a small little company. If it had taken off too quickly, we couldn't have kept up with it. We wouldn't have the money to give the pressing plant to make more records and then wait around to get paid for them. But he developed a good, loyal following, and it grew nationally at a pace that worked really well for us and for the band, too, I think. 1982, we got signed by EMI America and uh, put out the album Bay of the Bones. So that was that was big time. I mean, but the funny thing was, it was the same songs. It's the same band, same thing I've been doing for 10 years. So uh, it had a little bit more of a sparkle to it. You know, and there were, uh, of large members of Destroyer fans who almost boycotted the record. Because <laughs> they said, because no, George, no, God, he's got to be on a round of records. I said, it's the same. It's just, the label's just different. It's the, the same stuff. I think George reached a lot of people who liked the energy of punk, but might have also liked blues or other music. But there was a, a, a sense of humor in his music. You know, whether it was one bourbon, one scotch, one beer, or other songs that, you know, he, he became like an actor as well as a singer and guitar player. And he's always been a, a great entertainer, and I think that initially was a major part of it. You know, the word spread, and people said, you know, you got to see this guy, he's just so much fun. 